All right, how's it going, y'all? So today, we're gonna to be going over how to use Cloud Sync on Synology NAS. And Cloud Sync allows you to either sync, backup, or download files from your major cloud providers. Dropbox, Google Drive, Box.com, you name it, Synology Cloud Sync can probably download or upload to it. And it even is extendable out using WebDAV, so pretty much anything out there, Cloud Sync can probably interface with. And this is really great, but it also has some odd quirks to it. And so I first wanna talk about the use case for this. So the really good use case for this is kind of, in my opinion, twofold. One is an easy kind of backup to make, where if you don't wanna use hyper backup because you wanna just be able to see your files and go on the road, and you know, if you're remote and you just you grab a file, you can do that. So that is one of the good use cases for Cloud Sync is it's an okay backup. It does have some limitations though, specifically if you rename files, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute here. And then the other use case is for offices who are just constantly working on different mediums. And so say there's a team that's always using Dropbox and you're trying to get them off of it and you want people to be able to use it locally and things like that. Well, what you can do is you can set up a sync job. So it's automatically syncing the changes to and from Dropbox to the NAS. And so that way, half the team can edit it locally and half the team can edit it via Dropbox and everybody can just kind of work however they know how to in a time of transition. And so we're gonna talk about how to set that up and we're really gonna be stressing about some of the limitations here because it's really important to know those limitations. All right, so first off, what does it do? As I talked about, it allows you to sync with pretty much any cloud provider really easily. So we can just go ahead and open it on up. I've already installed it in the package center. And the first time you see this massive list of pretty much every major cloud provider. And then if you can't find yours, you hopefully can make it into an S3 compatible storage or WebDAV. So these two are kind of your, your open up like, hey, I can figure out how to make pretty much anything work unless it's completely locked down using either S3 bucket or WebDAV. So it's got a ton of options here and really allows you to do a bunch of stuff here. So you can even use Synology's now going into the C2 space, trying to basically go with what Backblaze has and what S3 does, whole expand out thing. But the one I'm gonna be talking about today is Dropbox. There's Dropbox and Dropbox team space. So it depends on what your account is. You'll see the same thing for Google Drive and Google Share Drive and Microsoft OneDrive and OneDrive for Business. There's a few of those that have like the, the two sides of it. And so it's never too bad. You just kind of got to figure out which one you actually signed up for because some of them it's kind of hard to tell and then go with that. So today we're going to be setting up with a Dropbox account. And all we need to do is we just need to go ahead and authenticate in. So right here, normally it would ask you to sign in. I already signed in, so my cookie's already on there, so you wouldn't have to see my sign-in. And now I'm just gonna hit allow. It's gonna say, hey, this is you, right? This is yours. We're, we're confirming, we're about to send over an authentication code to this device. We wanna make sure that this is where it is. And so we say yes. And now we are connected on in. Now our options are very simple. We're going to give it a connection name. Note, this is the connection name. So every single connection to this Dropbox account will use this single connection name. And then you have multiple sync folders off that. I was confused by that for a while. So let's go ahead and do just a very basic, say I want to sync this folder and this folder perfectly. So we're going to just sync the entirety of this demo shared folder with the entirety of Dropbox. So anything that's in either one of these will be synced to the other one and we're gonna do it bi-directional. Then there are two additional useful options here, download remote changes only. So this is a good case where you want it to be kind of a backup. So you want your NAS to be a read only, essentially backup of the cloud. So what you can do is you can say download remote changes only. And so that way, you know nothing you do to your NAS will ever go up to the cloud. And you can also even tick don't remove files in the destination, i.e. in this case on the NAS, when they're removed in the source folder, in this case, on Dropbox. And so this way, if you wanna have kind of a backup, you can just say, hey, never delete something if it's been deleted off of Dropbox. But note, if you're constantly using Dropbox, uploading, downloading, deleting stuff, you may end up with a lot of space left on here. So use that at your own risk. A better option generally is just to apply snapshots on the folder, which will give you a much better option and will automatically be deleted after a period of time. There's also the option for upload local changes only, which is the exact same thing, just flipped. 
So this is great for having your NAS be backed up via Dropbox. But we're gonna go ahead and do bi-directional and we're not going to take data encryption because the protocols themselves already have data encryption on there. This is an extra level of data encryption that is kind of set up on Synology setup. So I would not tick that. And then for schedule settings, you can tell it to only run during certain times. Next, we've got the first one pretty much set up. There are a couple of really useful advanced settings that I'm gonna talk about here. One, it's super basic. If you just wanna like exclude certain folders, you can do that. And really, really, really great excluding of specific files. Super cool thing if you're doing this with a Google Drive, you can actually have a download only version of Google Drive that automatically converts Google Docs to Word Docs, which is pretty cool. But you can start excluding certain things or say, hey, if something's over 100 gigs, don't sync it. Bunch of options like that and you can customize it to your heart's content. And now we're just gonna hit done. We have successfully completed the setup and it's gonna sync. There's nothing in either one of those folders so it happens instantaneously. But now I'm just gonna go ahead and copy some files over there so we can see some of the cool stuff about this. So one of the best parts about this is it's multi-threaded. So I'm just going to copy this folder to that and we're gonna see it immediately start going. So I'm gonna copy it to demo and this has a bunch of images in it. And one of the best parts about this is the fact that it is multi-threaded. So when it's syncing, it's syncing multiple files at the exact same time, which is huge over a high latency connection. So one of the big advantages of this is if you have a high latency connection and you need to upload a ton of stuff, you can set how many files to upload at once. So we can do that by going into settings and tell us the concurrent upload slash downloads. So if you've got fast drives or just a ton of files to upload, you can set this to 10. And now even if every single upload has latency, it will get much better throughput because you're doing multiple things at the same time. So that is super useful to have and can max out pretty much any internet connection if you let it. So this can take over your complete internet upload speed, so be warned about that, but it can be very useful and actually the fastest way to sync files in a lot of cases because of that multi-threadedness. I really wish they would add this to Synology Drive. Another thing that's very useful to have is to set the polling interval. So the polling period is essentially how often the NAS scans for any changes to the with the folders. So if you have 100,000 files in here, you probably do not want it scanning the entire thing every minute, maybe every 10 minutes, maybe every hour. It depends on what it's used for and how quickly from the moment a file's change to the moment it starts at least syncing you want it to be. So an hour for 3,600 seconds, that would be really useful for a backup or a very underutilized system with a ton of files. But if you don't have a ton of files, 10 minutes or even one minute is totally fine. Then you can also start having limitations for max upload and download rate for a single file. So you need to multiply this value with how many concurrent tasks you're doing to the max overall throughput. It's kind of odd. And then history, you can just see a big old log here of everything. So now let's go in and let's open up Dropbox and we can actually see all these files that were boom just put in there. It quickly ran through all of them and uploaded them very quickly and very easily. I can go in and delete them here. And when we come back in over here, once that one minute polling interval is up, we'll see that boom, it is starting to delete a bunch of the files because it was told to. So that it is just keeping those two in sync. And so there is a ton of flexibility here. And it not only works obviously with FileStation, but any files edited via Synology Drive or Windows File Explorer, Mac OS Finder, pretty much any time that these files are edited, they will be reflected in the cloud, which is absolutely great. So now let's talk about some of the downsides of this, because there are a few. First off, every cloud has its own limitations. And so Synology has been nice enough to write this out. And so I will leave a link to this help article down here, this knowledge base uh, article. And say for Dropbox, let's find out what will not be synced to Dropbox. So Dropbox is not too bad. If it's named .dropbox or .cache, it won't be uploaded. And also if it's over 350 gigs or if you have too many folders, 
I will say the 5,000 folders is actually something you can get around and there are various ways to. Then you can look at Google Cloud. Google Cloud has a big issue right here because it will not sync things that have brackets in them. And brackets tend to be okay characters on most other file systems. And so you may run into a case where if any of these are matched, it quietly, without throwing an error, will just not sync those. So that is one big risk with using this is, hey, some files may just not be synced. And so you, you don't wanna rely on this as a backup if you think that any of these could possibly pertain to you. You kinda gotta watch out. And every single one of these is going to be specific to exactly what your setup is. So read it for whichever one you're actually syncing to. Another limitation is how the scanning actually works. So let's see, I go over to Dropbox and I'm gonna rename it to Joshua Tree. Had a great time. So I've just renamed it, right? Not a big deal. So now, once we do that, we come back in here and we are going to look at our logs and see what happened when we did that. So here, it actually had to download every single one of those files and folders because it did not realize that was a name change. So this obviously happened very quickly because these are tiny JPEGs, but it actually treated that as a delete of the old folder and a download of the new folder, even though all we did was rename it. We can see that when we go into recycle, we can see that Joshua Tree, when we click on it, has all of the exact images as Joshua Tree had a great time because it deleted them and then re-downloaded them. So with this folder was not a big deal, very small, but say you had a terabyte of files underneath this top level folder, you will have to refetch every single one of those files or re-upload every single one of those files, depending on where you did it, from the cloud because it's going to treat it as delete. That is probably the single biggest limitation with the cloud sync protocol. And in all honesty, there's no good way around it because the checksums they would have to do to make sure nothing has changed would be too much to guarantee that everything's good. They essentially have to download the entire file because a lot of these cloud services do not have checksums for them. And so there's no good way around it because it's not their protocol. So this is just kind of how it has to be, unfortunately. But it's just something you need to be aware of is this is not rename aware. Instead, a rename is a delete and a recreation of whatever folders and subfolders are within the folder that you have renamed. Same thing for files. But once you know those limitations and you understand it, CloudSync can be very powerful and very fast for certain workflows. So say you want a file that's automatically downloaded to a drive on your computer to be uploaded to Dropbox. You can automate that. You can automate so many different workflows and really be able to operate between multiple teams or even just back up your Google Drive and things like that. All right, well, that's gonna be it for this overview of CloudSync. It's really powerful and it's got a lot of great features, but you need to be aware of some of those things. Go and leave any of the tutorials you'd like to see me make in the comments below. And if you wanna hire me for a project, there's a link for that down in the description below. All right, have a good one. Bye.